on returning from the great camp meeting in eastern Maine, where I heard with deepest interest such men as Miller, Himes, and Preble. I find myself happy in the faith that Christ would come about the year 1843. I had given up all to teach the doctrine to others, and to prepare myself to do this was the great object before me. I had purchased the chart illustrating the prophecies of Daniel and John, used by the lecturers at that time, and had a good assortment of publications upon the manner, uh, object, and time of the Second Advent. And with this chart hung before me and these books and Bible in my hands, I spent several weeks in close study, which gave me a clear view of the subject. So the chart was something that was instrumental in um, James White's earliest very inception of his of his public labors. Um, this it helped him um, get a clear view on the subject. And did you also see? Uh, one second. I just need to um, mute somebody. Uh, did you also notice that he said that uh, it was used by the lecturers at that time? So he got that same chart. I had neither horse, saddle, bridle, nor money, yet felt that I must go. I had used my past winter's earnings in necessary clothing to in attending second advent meetings and in the purchase of books and the chart but my father offered me the use of a horse for for the winter and elder apolly gave me a saddle with uh, both pads torn off and several pieces of an old bridle i got, gladly accepted these and cheerfully placed the saddle on a breech log and nailed on the pads fastened the pieces of the bridle together with uh, malleable nails, I folded my chart with a few pamphlets on the subject of the advent over my breast, snugly buttoned up in my coat, and left my father's house on horseback. The one thing I want to take away about James White's character is that he's resourceful. He didn't have his own horse. One providentially was lent to him. He didn't have a uh, intact saddle but that's okay. He kind of makeshifted some things together and uh, based on what was given him, and uh, he put it together. Uh, he didn't have a lot of money, uh, but he's, you see he's going out in faith. He's got his chart too. A schoolmate of mine had engaged to teach school in the town of Burnham but by accident had lost an eye and was told by his physician that he should rest at least one week before teaching. He urged me to teach for him one week. I consented and on the first day of school gave an appointment for evening lectures. The schoolhouse was crowded. I gave seven lectures, which were listened to with interest and deep feeling. So he's given a horse. He's given some pieces of a, some saddle. Um, he puts it together. He, um, he, he gets out there. He starts going. Uh, he's got his chart. He's going out in faith. Then uh, providentially again, he was given a horse. Now this person unfortunately lost an eye, and now he's in a teaching position, and people are listening with interest. So God's opening up the way for him. Previous to this time, I had taken great delight in dwelling upon the evidence of the Advent hope and faith. But now I realize that there was a solemn power in these evidences to convict the people, such as I did not expect to realize. So he had he he had enjoyed uh, these truths, but I guess he he had supposed, and I'm thinking of my own life now, maybe you too. Maybe we don't think other people will appreciate these truths as much or there is as much power in these truths as there really is you, you see and what's on this chart what chart is he talking about this is the chart with the 2520 the 2300 days the 1260 the 1335 it's the prophetic periods with with uh with the images of the of the vision it's 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 uh it's the numbers it's the images it's the figures 
wow, there's there's power in these evidences. There's power in this message, and there's still power in this message. That's why it's to remain as truth um, all the way till the end of time. And eventually, uh, we will see it do a great work again. At this place, I began to feel the burden of the work, the condition of the people, and love for precious souls as I had not before. At the close of my last lecture, 60 arose for prayers. I felt deeply the condition of the people, but what could I do for them? I had not anticipated that I should ever have upon my hands 60 repenting sinners and was wholly unprepared to lead them any further. My little pond of thought in the course of seven lectures had run out, and I dared not undertake to preach a practical discourse for fear it would prove a failure and injure the well-being, well-begun work. He ran out of material. In this state of things, it occurred to me to send for my brother, who had been in the ministry five years before me and was favorable to the Advent doctrine. He came and labored six weeks, baptized and organized a large church for which they paid him $60. I paid at the close of my week's teaching and lectures $1 for housekeeping and left for uh, Kenbeck. My brother afterward told me that everyone he baptized dated their experience from my lectures. The preaching of definite time, the preaching of the Advent message. It'll get baptisms. And this is the first angel's message. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour, for the time, in other words, of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And that's what James White was doing. He was showing the hour. That's what the message is. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. This angel's message represents the last mission of mercy to the world, and it has been fulfilled. The original apostolic message was, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. The last message to the world was repent for the hour or time of his judgment is come. It's here now. Time was connected with this that message, and that time was 1843. God said by the prophet, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. So there's um, there he's um, he's pointing to that 1843 chart that he had folded up and 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 took on horseback. And had his first evangelistic series, of which he had much success. The whole Advent host once believed that publishing the visions of Daniel and John on the chart, from which the Swiss, swift messengers lectured in 42 and 43, was a fulfillment of this prophecy. Look at that. The whole Advent host once believed that. And the unbelief of those who doubt now does not prove that we were all mistaken then. The passing of the time and the perpetual backsliding and unbelief of Adventists has not changed the truth of God into a lie, but it remains truth still. He's saying this in 1850. So he's, in 1850, um, you'll see that actually he was publishing things that um, that 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 speak truthfully of um, these messages, I will just uh, back out of this really quick and uh, show you something just really quick. There we go. Um, so if we come up here, for instance, the same same year, the Lord showed me that he, James, must take the testimonies that the leading Adventist published in 44 and republish them and make them ashamed. He is now doing that work. So who would be these leading brethren that were publishing things? Um, Times, um, this, this, this man uh, right here, Miller. And so this is, so the, so here he, he's actually gonna do this work at September, 1850 now. 
the republishment of the testimonies of the leading Advent preachers after the seventh month, 44 and 45, is seasonable, and it will have a salutary effect in reviving the hearts of those who hold sacred the seventh month cry and lead them to a deeper examination of the present truth, the shut door and the commandments of God. The testimony to the world was bound up in 1844. And since that is the sealing of the law of God upon the disciples who hold fast the testimony. This is actually, um, the person that's actually saying this is, I believe is Otis Nichols. I believe that's a, a picture right there of Otis Nichols right there. And he's actually the one that put the 1850 chart together. Our design in this review is to cheer and refresh the true believer by showing the fulfillment of prophecy and the past wonderful work of God and calling out and separating from the world and nominal church a people who are looking for the second advent of the dear Savior. So here's the advent review. These are the thrilling testimonies, right? This is what uh, Miss White is saying. He sh she was showing that James must take the testimonies that the leading advent is published in 44. This is right after the disappointment. We're still in 44. What were they saying right after the disappointment? So here we have the thrilling testimonies, right? And if you look, uh, it speaks about uh, the proclamation of time, the 1843, as it was written on the chart, that nobody can deny that this is what aroused the advent people. And there are some who are still calling themselves the Adventists, and at the same time, call the very means that have brought them to the scriptural faith and hope a mistake, fanaticism, mesmerism, and some have said of the devil. You know, some people today say the 2520 is of the devil. In reviewing the past, we shall quote largely from the writings of the leaders in the Advent cause and show that they once boldly advocated and published to the world the same position relative to the fulfillment of prophecy and the great leading Advent movements in our past experience that we now occupy, and that when the Advent hosts were all united in 1844, they looked upon these movements in the same light in which we now view them and thus show who have left the original faith. So James White's saying, it's not us. It's the first day Adventists who have left the original faith. We still believe in the chart and everything on it. It was the United Testimony of the Second Advent Lectures and Papers, when standing on the original faith, that was the publication of the chart, that the publication of the chart was a fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, 2, 3. This is the original faith. Before everything, before everything, before sanctuary message, before state of the dead, before the personality of God in Christ, before Daniel 11, before everything, this is the original faith. This is the, this is, this is the foundation here. The special attention of the reader is called to the following lengthy extract. It is excellent. Read it carefully and prayerfully, and it will lead you to have confidence in your past experience in the Holy Advent cause, confidence in God and his Holy Word. It is from the Advent Herald for November 13th, 1844. So if, right after the disappointment, we have Himes, Bliss, and Hale. They're going to confirm the old faith. They didn't abandon it just yet. They held on for some months. They confirmed it. So they have a confession here. And um, this is all important, but I just want to show you um, just some particular doctrinal points. And um, we have the seven times um, here. So they're they're conf after the disappointment, they're preaching the uh, 2520 before, and they're confirming it after. They were all still uh, believing in it. Um, they speak of the 2450, 2300 days. They reaffirm all the positions that they had, all the evidences that they had. So that's all I wanted to show you there was that they were, that was what, that was the testimony that Miss White was saying that James White really needed to get out. And that's what he did get out. Now. Let's jump. Um, but in the same year that this is happening, in the same year that this is happening, this is 
old testimonies are getting out. Something else is happening. Further evidence. In our, in our next conference was in Fairhaven. Brother Bates and wife were present. This is Miss White speaking in 16MR 207. Brother Bates and wife were present. It was quite a good meeting. On a return to Brother Nichols, the Lord gave me a vision and showed me that the truth must be made plain upon tables. And it would cause many to decide for the truth by the three angels' messages, with the two former being made plain upon tables. So she's given a vision and saying, we need another chart. So at the same time that they're republishing these messages that confirm what was rich, written on the 1843 chart, what the leaders were saying in 44, specifically November 13th, 1844, in the spring of 1845, I believe, we the, she was shown that we need to get another chart out. I sent this vision to you for you to read to the church in Topsham. Brother Rhodes came here last Tuesday, which is just one week ago today. We were glad to see him. He has just got out a new chart. It is larger than any chart I ever saw. It is very clear. We like his chart much. We like his chart much. Uh, now, before I get into um, uh, Brother Rhodes, I want to just show you one thing. Um, this is not going to surprise you, um, but we'll we'll just uh, we'll just deal with this right now. Um, and hold on, it's we're almost there. Okay. What is this? He, Brother Rhodes, has just got out a new chart. It is larger than any chart I ever saw. It is very clear. Froom, the 1850 Rhodes Nichols chart, which was cluttered with detail both in the symbols and in the text. Are they saying the same thing? Is this the same message? This is not. Miss White is saying the Rhodes chart is very clear. Froom is saying it is cluttered with detail, both in the symbols and in the text. What is he doing? Why is he saying that? The 1863 white chart was definitely an improvement over the 1850 Rhodes and Nichols chart, which was cluttered with detail, both in the symbols and in the text. Haven't you heard a lot of ministers echo the sentiment before? especially in the uh, corporate church. They're getting their ideas from Froome, a Freemason, a trickster, someone that's there to undermine the foundations. And so his opinion is worthless. And I just wanted to show you that here he is again, doing divisive things is a bad man and you already knew that but there's just a little extra evidence for you he's he spreads confusion that's what he likes to do okay there's a comparison you might be thinking who's samuel rose samuel rose is an important person but you haven't heard much about him there's a comparison that's made between uh, Samuel Rhodes and somebody else. And we'll see that soon. I'm going to read Luke 6, uh, 13 through 16. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose 12, whom also he named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John. So Simon... Peter, Andrew, James, and John, those are the ones that we know well about. We also know about Philip and uh, Bartholomew or, or Nathaniel. We know about them pretty well. Uh, Matthew, we know pretty well, and Thomas. But then after about that, uh, the last couple we don't know too much about, uh, James, uh, the lesser, right? Uh, Simon, he's a zealot. That's what they call him. Uh, Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. And we know Judas well, right? 
but we don't really know Simon the Zealot too well, right? Not much is said about him. I believe this is uh, Samuel. I, I believe this is uh, Rose's grave. I, I don't think this is the actual picture of his grave. I think I think uh, I can't remember. This is a couple of years back. I think I just. I think I just pulled up a picture, but you know, this notice what Arthur Spalding is saying. But by the plat, I found it directly in front of the chapel, and on Oak Avenue, in a lot, no grave in which is marked. If any desire to know the spot, it is lot 1010, burial right seven, and the sexton will show it to you. Same uh, Samuel Rhodes. So even in death, uh, according to God's providence, he's uh, not remembered. Um, no grave in which is marked. And so he was he was often um the comparison was often made between him and Simon Zealot. Like he was one of the 12, but he's the one that everybody forgets about. So we're going to, we're going to learn uh, more about him. And uh, right now, uh, about eight days before our last conference at the house of uh, brother Harris in Centerport, I dreamed of attending the meeting. And as I came into the room where the brethren were, most of them appeared cheerful and happy. I was anxious to make my way through the room into another. I thought some of the brethren were disposed to draw my attention away from going into the other room by talking to me. But my, I made my way along and got hold of the door. So he's determined to get to that other room. At this point, a number stood in, my, in the way and Sister White stood next to the door. And for some time prevented me from opening it. I held onto the door waiting patiently for Sister White to remove out of the way. At length, she moved, and I opened the door and passed into the room. Here I saw a number bowed down to the floor. I dreamed that one of them rose up and put his arms around my neck and said, Oh, Brother Edson, I am in the dark. I am in the dark. I awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So again, just a sort of a quick synopsis of of his dream here. He enters into this um, he enters into this uh, house. It's a really good time. His his friends are there. Everybody's um, everybody's having a chat. It's it kind of almost sounds like a little uh, party, if you will, and um, nothing crazy, of course. But everybody's having a nice time together, and. Um, he really is determined to get to this other room and he feels like people are drawing his attention away. Like they're trying, they're talking to him, but he has this mission and he's got to get to this other room. Eventually there's, um, um, uh, people are standing in the way of the door to enter into the other room, especially Miss White. He's waiting patiently for her to move so he can get to this room. When he gets into this room, um, um, we're going to see that this is uh, relates to uh, a brother Rhodes. As a general thing, I have placed but little confidence in dreams and seldom tell one. But my mind was deeply impressed that I should see a fulfillment of this dream, in part at the Centerport meeting. It is now clear to me that what took place at the Centerport meeting in relation to brother Rhodes' case was a fulfillment of most of the above dream. You know, so he was even impressed that this dream would be fulfilled, and it was. Uh, Monday, November 19th, we started on the on our journey in full faith that God had taken Brother Rhodes's case into his own hands and that he would come with us for when God works, something is accomplished. As we journeyed on, we felt the presence of God and his attending angels. We did not have to go into the wilderness for Brother Rhodes had come out a few days previous, and we found him at work in a field on a rise of ground on the east side of Black River. We told him that we had come in the name of the Lord to get him to go with us and to see the brethren and go with us to, into the kingdom. God displayed 
his convincing power. And Brother uh, Ralph spoke in a new tongue and gave the interpretation and power and in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. So speaking in tongues. Um, Brother Rhodes finally consented to come with us and went about arranging his business in order to leave. While he was doing this work, Brother Ralph and myself took a walk down to the river and spent some time viewing it and its banks. So it would have looked something like this. This is actually the same um, um, place, I believe. When Brother Rhodes came back the next day, he said to us, I thought by this time that you had concluded to go without me and let me stay here. We told him, no, he need not think any such thing. He turned from us and said, it's too much. I cannot stand it and started for the woods. I feared that he was going away from us not to return again. So I started and ran after him and found him on his face, asking the Lord what all this meant, why his children should feel so much for him. I wish here to relate a dream, which I dreamt about two years since, of which the above seems to be a fulfillment. I dreamed of going after Brother Rhodes. I thought he was in a field at work, and as I went where he was, I had to ascend a rise of ground. After having some conversation with him, it appeared by some means that he was absent from me. I dreamed of going with some person down by the bank of the river and was sometime there viewing the river and its banks. Again, I thought I saw Brother Rhodes. And he was making his way off from me down a descent of ground. I feared it was to hide away from me, so I ran after him and found him. I dreamed of taking I, I dreamed of talking with him, and as near as I can remember. He was disconsolate. He said he had no hope of entering the kingdom, and it was of no use for him to try. Here I awoke. So this is, a, this is like to the letter, is it not, of the actual experience? And he had, dream, he had dreamt this two years earlier, probably not thinking too much of it. But then when he had that second dream, it wouldn't surprise me if some memories started to awaken in him. Two or three nights before we saw Brother Rhodes, he dreamed that two men came to him who were on their way to the kingdom. So you see how God's working providentially? Um, yeah, you know, dreams, should we give them um, much thought? When they start, when one dream starts to relate to another or somebody else is having a dream that's confirming it, then we need to really pay attention because that's how God works. Uh, we were studying on Wednesday uh, Joseph's name, which means repeated or doubled. And we know in the story of the Bible, and the Bible is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. When Joseph Joseph understood something, when, when there was two people that had two dreams, and they were so very similar to each other. They both have the number three in it and such. And uh, he's like, these things are going... these. The reason that the, it was given twice is because the thing is established. So this is God. This is how God. This is how God works. God gives repeated evidence, whether it be in doctrine or whether it's some impression or something like that. It's He's going to He's going to confirm things, and so that's what basically the name Joseph means. It means added, double, repeated. It's it's that blessed assurance. It's that it's that you know these these uh, these double blessings these these extra assurances these extra evidences things coming to pass um, more than once. Uh, so so we can see here that Brother Rhodes now is having a dream too. Um, his heart's being prepared. Something asked him if he did not want to go with them to the kingdom, which was just before them. He said he did and turned partly around to see the men. But something seemed to say that he could not go with these two men. The thought of not being permitted to go with them caused him great distress. The men still waited for him, and he awoke. 
Friday, November 23rd, we returned as far as Brother Arnold's of Volney. And our dear brother rode with us. Sabbath morning, we came to this place in company with Brother and Sister Arnold, where many of the brethren in this region were assembled. They were all rejoiced to see Brother Rose. Tear of joy and tenderness flowed freely as they greeted each other. We had a sweet heavenly sitting together during the meeting, and Brother Rhodes faith and hope are fast increasing. He stands firm in all the present truth, and we heartily bid him Godspeed as he goes to search out and feed the precious scattered flock of Jesus. This is the Higher Medicine, 1849. Brother Rhodes was a great preacher in, uh, in, during the Millerite movement, and he got very discouraged after the disappointment, and he went to live deep in the woods, away from all uh, civilization. This is from uh, Footprints of the Pioneers by uh, Arthur Spaulding. In the autumn of 1849, James and Ellen White came into New York State and settled for a time in Oswego, publishing their six numbers of present truth. In November, a meeting was appointed at Centerport, about 20 miles south of Oswego, for the believers in, the, in that western country. The Whites, with Edson and others, led the meeting. Ms. White did not sympathize with Hiram Edson's purpose to seek out Samuel Rhodes again. She thought from reports that Rhodes was not worthy of so much solicitude. But in a vision at this meeting, she was shown that the Lord was seeking him, that the brethren should go to find him and persuade him to come back. So, you know, it's this this idea of we need to be careful with dreams. Uh, Edson wants to go. He sees in the dream that she's actually holding him up. Eventually, God gives her a vision and um, she moves out of the way, just like in the dream. I saw Brother Rhodes in, th in that thick darkness, but he still bore the image of Jesus. I saw that it was the will of God that Brother Edson and Ralph go after him. Then I was shown Brother Rhodes' past labors in the Advent cause, that he had been mighty in word and in deed. I saw him standing before the people with the Bible in his hand and a, a stream of light coming from his mouth. I saw that he proclaimed the Advent with great confidence and had shown his faith by his works. And when the time passed, the disappointment was very great. Then some professed Adventists wounded his heart, and I saw him overwhelmed with discouragement and grief, and he left the little flock and retired to the wilderness. I saw that Jesus was pleading his blood for Brother Rhodes and that the angel was ready to enroll his name as soon as he would come out of that dark place and stand on all the present truth. That's something that we need to take into consideration, too. That the angel is ready to write our name. Jesus is, loves us, pleading for us, so merciful, so long-suffering. Um, and that, um, as I, I would say, let's, let's, let's apply this to ourselves too. If, if it's how a uh, brother Rhodes is to be saved and it's how we're to be saved as soon as he would come out of the dark place and stand on all the present truth. And we saw some of the, we saw the testimonies earlier, right? James White was to publish the testimonies of the leading brethren in 44, specifically speaking of November 23rd. And the devil was trying to hold him up. And what was the, what were the specific doctrinal points? The 2520, the 2450, the 2300 days. These are still all present truth. And uh, we, are, we are living in a time during the rise of the fourth angel. All these messages become one. Um, all these messages are reinstated. All these messages are reproduced under the loud cry of the third angel. That's an inspired thought there. Not coming from me. I read it, but that's the truth. And so we also need to stand on all the present truth. The angel pointed me to the snare of Satan that bound him, and I saw that he thought that there was no hope, no mercy for him, and it would be of no use for him to try. I saw that Brother Edson and Ralph should make him believe there was hope and mercy for him and tear him away. Then he would come among the flock, and that angels would attend them on their journey. I heard an angel say, can ye not see the worth of the soul? Pull him out of the fire. I saw that in Brother Rhodes' mouth there had been no guile in speaking against the present truth, relating to the Sabbath and shut door. 
I also saw that the Lord had laid Brother Rhodes' case heavily on Brother Edson, so much so that he was, uh, you know, he was given him, he gave him these two dreams. James White wrote of him, no man has more freely given all for a treasure in heaven than Brother Rhodes. His commendable zeal in the cause and success in convincing the people of the truth has caused our enemies to wickedly reproach him. So, uh, he's, he's famous for his zealousness, like Simon the Zealot. Brother Rhodes, uh, Loughborough is speaking, was one of the most powerful and self-sacrificing lecturers in the Second Advent that ever lectured in this region. He spent a handsome property in the cause, in the distribution of publications, helping others out in the field, into the field, and in bearing his own expenses from place to place to sound the message until his means was entirely exhausted. Uh, continuing, the course he pursued was a great force in his labors. For the people said it was a sure evidence of the genuineness of, the, of his work. Great crowds would come to hear him. This seemed to be a fence to the popular churches, especially as they near the time when the Adventists expected the Lord to come. Fifteen MR two twelve. We have received an excellent letter from Brother Rhodes. He is valiant for the truth, and God has been making him mighty. Many souls have been brought into the truth through his labors. So now we're, we're now we're speaking of him. Uh, preaching the third angel's message now. So many souls, he's he's back to his former self. Uh, December 13th, 1850. Here's a letter to Brother Rhodes. Dear Brother Rhodes, uh, uh, was with us in our last conference. It was good to see his face once more and cheering to hear him talk the plain cutting truth of God from the Bible. How plain our position is. We know that we have the truth. Brother Rhodes has now gone in company with Brother John Andrews, just Jane Andrews, in the eastern part of the state to hunt up the scattered sheep. We have received two letters from them. God is at work and is bringing souls from the rubbish to the clear light of truth. That rubbish from Miller's dream. We have received cheering letters from, from different places. God is with Israel. We're in the gathering time now. They're going after the scattered sheep, all those jewels that have been scattered about after 44. As our meeting progressed, these fanatics sought to rise and speak, but they could not find opportunity. It was made plain to them that their presence was not wanted, but they chose to remain. Then Brother Samuel Rose seized the back of the chair in which one of the women was sitting and drew her out of the room and across the porch under the lawn. Returning to the meeting room, he drew out the other woman in the same manner. The two men left the meeting room, but sought to return. So you can see, you can see his zeal here, and um, and, and some of his methods maybe um, some would consider um, unorthodox, but I like uh, Samuel Rhodes. Um, just uh, there is a certain assertiveness, manliness, boldness uh, to this character here that he actually took these women uh, and 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 basically put them out on the lawn. You're not welcome here. The next few years saw Rhodes in vigorous action. He preached and he exhorted and he won many converts. The fire of opponents became concentrated upon him. He brought into the faith H.S. Case, who was for some time thereafter an earnest preacher, before he departed on his messenger way. And Rhodes baptized also, this is speaking of the messenger party, uh, which is the first you know, uh, apostasy in uh, Seventh-day Adventist history, uh, mid-1850s. And Rhodes baptized also three sons of uh, Silas Guilford, uh, brother-in-law of William. The oldest of Silas's sons was Irving the boy who took the message to William Miller on the August morning 20 years before. Isn't that something? 
Now we're familiar with that story. Uh, when brother, um, when um, William Miller was pr- praying in the grove, and he's like, if you open the way, Lord, I'll go. And of course he's thinking, nobody's going to open the way for me. And so this, um, uh, you know, uh, um, William Miller's um, nephew, it is, um, uh, comes to him and says, hey, there's an opening. They want to hear what you have to say. And um, he knew that this boy was actually on his way to get him based on where he was, where he came from, before even the the, the prayer was said and finished. And so that's God's again, that's that's these are these are we can recognize God's providences in the circumstances of our life as well. So Samuel uh, Rhodes retrieved this man. Samuel Rhodes in this period was a blazing star, eager, impetuous, warm hearted, loyal, and he was fiery. His enemies threw accusations against him of every sort, from lying to spiritual wifery. Okay, many I saw sleeping. I said, as I saw these poor souls, they have heard of Jesus coming and that great day of God's wrath is just upon them. But as time went on a little longer than they expected it would, they have lost their interest. Stupidity has crept over them and now they slumber never to awake. They ought to have watched and then they would have seen the angels. This dream has made quite an impression upon my mind. I actually don't, um, that slide might be, I'm not sure exactly why that's there. Let's see if we keep going. Um, again, this is an old PowerPoint. I should have looked over it, um, in more detail. Uh, I don't have anything to say on that, but anyways, continuing. I saw the chart making business was all wrong. It originated with, uh, brother Rhodes and was followed out by a brother case. Means has been spent in making charts and forming uncouth, disgusting images to represent angels and the glorious Jesus. Such thing I saw were displeasing to God. I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. I saw that there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. And if this chart is designed for God's people, if it's sufficient for one, it is for another. And if one needed a new chart painted on a larger scale, all need it just as much. So this is the the brothers nick uh the uh 1850 chart that's um uh being spoken of here now i will mind mind you that the it, it does seem that brother rhodes uh first chart which was spoken well of which we looked at earlier in the presentation um may have inspired uh probably inspired a nickels chart we um let's go back to that um We'll look at this in just a second, uh, but let's look at, um, I have this little flow chart here. Chart business originated with Rhodes. Um, the one that Nichols is in, God is in it. Prophecy of it, of the Bible, large scale, I'll need it. Brother Case followed out what Rhodes has started. Uh, wasted means to pleasing to God. This could be... Um, this could be what's being spoken of here, or maybe, you know, Rhodes's first chart that he made before Nichols, that one was good. And then maybe after Nichols, he started a chart business himself and it was not good. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. Um, it could be one of the two scenarios, though. By the way, we're just talking about cases, um, disgusting images. Uh, instead of having angels, they look like demons. You know, in uh, Damsteet's book, look at the look at the cover. It's interesting because he's reporting on this history, but but it's it's like he is not acknowledging it or living by it. He these look like demons here. Right, these are supposed to be the three. These are supposed to be the three angels, but they don't have a. I don't know they don't they don't have a. They, it's it's not like their countenance um is shining light from heaven and if you look at lewis weir's book certainty of the third angel's message which is one of the most satanic books ever written in adventist history in in, in my opinion um 
is certainly one of the most quintessential books of a new order. There's something similar. He's got demons on the front of his book. Anyways, uh, something, um, some, some, some uh, interesting history in this book. Um, there's a section on the charts, 43, 50, and 63 chart. And of the 50 chart, it says, Rhodes Samuel, a pictorial illustration of the visions of Daniel and John in their chronology. And so Otis Nichols printed it, but Samuel's Rhodes is being given uh, credit here as well for the 1850 chart. And when we look at uh, what Froome said, the 1863 white chart was definitely an improvement over the 1850 Rhodes Nichols chart which was cluttered with detail both in the symbols and in the text. The Rhodes is getting credit from Froome um, on this, right? And then this was the slide that we looked at earlier. Bro he, Brother Rhodes, has just got out a new chart. It is larger than any chart I ever saw. It is very clear. It is very clear. And, um, and then look how he's saying the exact opposite. He's saying it's cluttered with detail both in symbols and in text. So Froome is a confusionist. One thing that's interesting too is it's larger than any chart I ever saw. It's larger than any chart I ever saw, which is interesting because in that quote that we just read, uh, all the way up here, where it says, I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. I saw there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. And if this chart is designed for God's people, if it is sufficient for one, it is for another. And if one needed a new chart painted on a larger scale, all needed it just as much. And it was, and she was saying of uh, Samuel Rose's chart, which came out around the same time, it's larger than any, than one I have ever seen before. So I think there is a, I think there is a connection between Rose's chart and Nichols' chart. Okay. This is, this is speaking of uh, Brother Case. He desires to get up another chart. I saw that these painted charts had a bad effect upon the congregation. We don't need another chart. 1843 and 1850 are good. 1863 is good too, but it is um, it doesn't have as much doctrine on it. Okay, we've um, we've we've read that. Monday we return to uh, Dorchester, where our dear brother Rhodes and family live. There in the night, God gave me a very interesting vision, the most of which you will see in the paper. God showed me the necessity of getting out a chart. I saw that it was needed, and that the truth, and that the truth made plain upon tables would affect much and would cause souls to come to the knowledge of the truth. So it isn't interesting that she has the dream, uh, the vision of the new chart, the 1850 chart, um, in Brother Nichols's house, and he would be the one that would put it together. On our return to Brother Nichols, the Lord gave me a vision and showed me that the truth must be made plain upon tables, and it would cause many to decide for the truth by the three angels' messages, with the four, two former being made plain upon tables. So this is the 1843 chart is the first and second angels' messages, and the 1850 chart is first, second, and third angels' messages, and the 2520 is on both. It's established, right? That's we want to start thinking that way. When God does things twice, God has a prophecy of the Bible in the Bible about a chart getting made up, and and he make anybody actually has it fulfilled twice, right? And he even has a prophetess. He gives her a, a prophetess a vision saying that the chart that we need to get out another one. They both have the same doctrine on it. And then there's statements where that uh, the figures are not to be altered. God had placed the figures where he wanted them. And still people try to get rid of the 2520. They do not like it. They want to get rid of it. They want to get rid of the 1335. 
And eventually Satan's objective is to get rid of the 2300 days in 1260. Okay, we're going to stop uh, there. Um, I thank you everybody um, uh, for attending this. The, um, the conclusion of the matter is that um, God again leads providentially um through his word which rightly divides everything but also through uh we know through nature the book of nature is uh very very important and there's so many lessons there and a good reason to do country living so we can um interact with the birds and the insects and and um, all the wildlife they all have a, a a story for us um god is trying to communicate truth um uh, through his creation and the bible helps us to rightly divide all these things but also, especially in these end times, we have um, we're not the quench of the spirit. Uh, he's going to uh, pour out his um, his spirit upon all flesh. Uh, your monk, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And so here we're so, here's here's a good example of um, Hiram Edson, who had received a vision um, of Christ moving in the sanctuary, also received uh, some dreams. And I think the reason why. Um, I think the reason why God um, had the whites um, uh, standing um, there um, in front of the door, and I say the whites plural because I think in another place, um, 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 I think James was also there as well, um, is because the Lord had uh, the Lord wanted to test Hiram Edson's faith as well. Um, you know, you have a prophetess and, um, and, and, um, and the leader of the movement, James White and others who are, you know, uh, casting doubt on, um, what had God had revealed to him. And, um, they were, they were standing in his way. Um, but if we can remember things like what we learned on Wednesday night, that, when things double, when things repeat, when things happen twice, that is a good providential indicator that God is trying to communicate something to you. We talked about how sometimes we go through the same trial twice. That's because God is trying to get our attention. And um, and God is, and so we should use these experiences uh, that we've collected of uh, over the years uh, to make future decisions. Um, the Lord has given us wisdom. And um, and so for in the case of higher medicine, he had given him this dream two years prior. And then he gives him this other dream. And. Um, and then he even goes and then he even has an experience where he goes to what was it was it called Centerport? Uh, when he goes to this meeting and he's like, the, the dream is the, I, I can see that the dream is actually. um the dream is coming to fruition. It's coming true. I really do need to go out. Eventually, uh, God gives Miss White a vision. And it's like this is this is actually what's going on, and uh, so um, the doors were open for him to go. And so that's um, we want to be careful not to quench the spirit. And um, um, again, the to the law and to the testimony, they speak not according to this word. There's no light in them. And so the Bible rightly divides all these impressions, all these signs, all these uh, dreams, all of these um, lessons in nature. Uh, nature is corrupted now, uh, so we, we do need the Bible to uh, rightly divide it. Uh, but it still has um, it, sp it still testifies of God's character and um it still has wisdom for us to guide us in life. And so that's the moral of the story. And uh, also uh, hopefully you enjoy learning about Samuel Rhodes and are, um, are, are encouraged um, by, his, um, by his zeal. And so now when you think of Simon, um, the zealot, the disciple that um, is not spoken of, um, you will remember Samuel Rhodes who... Um, is sleeping in Christ um, under an unmarked, um, and he doesn't, in his grave is not marked, but it is there. He is there. So he'll come up in the resurrection, and uh, may we all be led uh, providentially, because that's how God leads. Okay.